man, what what is going on here? Guys, we just can't stop talking about not because of their play, because they literally have not played. Ben Simmons and Kyrie Irving. Krishnan, he's only 25. A, will he consistently be on the court? And B, will he be committed to the team that he moves to, right? Krishnan, honestly, I don't understand this guy. Yeah. He likes to be a problem child. That's my problem with him. Personality-wise, it seems like a terrible fit. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It comes back to just bad management. This is very interesting. When Lonzo and Caruso are playing, give up scoring. You cannot score against them. I expected they'd be good, but they have been unbelievable. Steve Kerr is a genius. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of All About Sports, the podcast, a podcast by the fans and for the fans. You're joined today by two of your co-hosts, Mazar Gadiwala. Hey everyone. And myself, Rishabh Krishnan. A quick reminder before we get into this week's episode, do check out last week's episode. We talked about salary caps and their value across sports, specific sports that might need it more than other sports and kind of how to bring in that structure through team caps, individual caps, what would you know potentially work better. Moving on from last week, let's now get into this week. This week is an NBA episode. For those of you who do listen, you oftentimes notice when it's me and Muzz, we typically go into the NBA. Uh, so this week is all about the NBA. We're going to discuss a few different topics. We're going to get a little status update on Kyrie Irving and Ben Simmons, our thoughts on potentially where they should move. We're also going to, going to go into some of our biggest surprises from the season so far. So we're going to do a couple of things uh, during our discussion today on the NBA. But before that, Muzz, a bit of an announcement. Uh, that we heard about yesterday on the sporting world. We try and cover as many sports as we can. So before we switch over to the NBA, Muz, what's going on in the footballing world, man? So Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, of course, by the time everyone watches this, they'll all know the exact update and what went on. Ole's press conference with Manchester United officially was released just an hour or so back. And the news, and it was quite emotional for United fans and I've never been vocal about Oli in general. I've never been critical about him as a manager I, because I just couldn't get myself to critique him in terms of a lot of, for a lot of reasons. And I've always been a supporter through thick and thin for the managers of the club, even Moyes, even though we all know what happened there. But just, I guess, when you grow up supporting a club, And you know what goes on behind the scenes and you know how controversial the ownership has been for the club. It's hard to point the finger at someone when things are going wrong. It's easy to blame the manager. And of course, there was things that weren't working out and quite clearly we were seeing it. But I don't know. It's it's a tricky one. But uh, sad to see Oli leave. Wish it had worked out better. But he also admitted that uh, maybe this was a bit too much for him and maybe the ask now with this side and the expectations was something that he potentially couldn't live up to. But thank you to Solchai. Of course, he's not going to listen to this, but uh, a big thank you to, to... I mean, he has the time. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but definitely, apart from the memories on the pitch as a player, he has given Manchester United fans hope again. He gave... Manchester United fans and a proper team, a team that looks very, uh, you know, cohesive. Maybe it's not worked out on the pitch yet and we've had some bad dark times, but there is like this togetherness that is clearly visible. The players do care for each other. Uh, Fans have never been more, let's say, I would say, divided in terms of their opinion of the club and what they should have seen. I know a lot of Oli out people. I can't even really blame them, but I think it's time for the fans to get back to and become united again. And uh, let's hope for the best because this Manchester United team, and I'm not talking about it as a United fan, definitely this Manchester United team should be challenging to make the English league more interesting. So... Um, let's see who comes in. Hopefully, by the time this episode is released, United will know who the replacement is. For now, it's going to be Carrick. 
Not sure how that will go either, but there's always that new manager bounce, so fingers crossed. I know. I think they're hoping and praying Zizou is uh, on the market. He's basically the only person, big name on the market. So it, it'll be an, an interesting one for uh, for United. I mean, yeah, there are there, there's talks about Ten Hag. But again, even if that happens, he's not going to leave Ajax mid-season. So then that interim role will have to be filled by Carrick only. And I'm not sure how, <laughs> how effective that might be. We don't know anything about Carrick uh, or his experience. So... Only results will talk and hopefully, um, I, I mean, this four-game losing skid needs to stop. <laughs> Just, I'll take a and draw at this point as well, but let's see how it goes. I, I, think, I think you're right, Maz. And, and the, exactly like you said, the new manager bump is uh, pretty much an established established theory now across sports. And I think, Maz, just one final call-out, you know, I think w- one thing that is that has been very apparent through this entire process is the sheer respect that the Manchester United fan base has for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and the board. Right, it was very respectful in the way in which he was thrown out. He actually technically resigned, but we all know what that meant. Um, it was very, very respectful, and every single Manchester United fan, even yesterday, interestingly, Maz, I was in an Uber ride, and this Romanian driver, who's a huge United fan, was talking about his memories of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer from like 1998, and he was talking about how like I love this guy. He just is not in a place to be a manager of a club of this level just yet. He might be at some point, but not just yet. So there's a sense of respect all around for what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer means to this club. And even for respect for what he's done, it's just this isn't the right time. He's not at that level just yet. Uh, But let's see what happens with United. As an Arsenal fan, I hope it doesn't get figured out at all. Ten Hag, just stay your stay your place in Ajax. Zizou, if you want to come back, come back. But then do that thing you do where you you know come for one season and then go back into retirement. That works for me. That's that's fine if you want to do that, Zizou. <laughs> but with that, Muz, let's transition over into uh, into basketball, into the NBA, Muz. Let's talk about the two hot guys, right? The guys who we just can't stop talking about, not because of their play, because they literally have not played. Ben Simmons and Kyrie Irving. First off, Muzz, Ben Simmons, the relationship with Philadelphia 76ers is just looking worse and worse by the day. Each time we think there's some optimism, the 76ers ask him to um, basically take some sessions with a mental health uh, physician who they kind of you know provided to him. He initially refused. I believe now he's come back, but we're still very unsure. Overall, the relationship seems terrible. Muzz, what are your thoughts on this overall chaos between the team and the player. It's really sad how social media has taken the world by storm in a lot of ways, Krishnan. Uh, I know we are running a podcast on social media platforms trying to get visibility, but the point is, the point is that it's so toxic for athletes and players, especially elite professionals, right? Ben Simmons is, at the end of the day, a, fir- a first round, first pick in the NBA draft. He is Australia's greatest, most skillful ever player to have played in the NBA. Maybe not records-wise. Obviously, Paddy Mills takes that 100% in terms of records and titles and all of that. But the point is, the guy is a specimen. To be so tall and athletic and to play point guard the way he does and to see the game and read the game so well, it's just sad what how Philly has treated him as well. And I think that was brought out by Joel Embiid simply saying when he spoke in that first, uh, uh, whatever, that presser that they had on court uh, when the first time they played in Philly where he such came out in support of Simmons. So, I don't know. I, I really don't know what to make of it. And he's, he's still so young. That's the thing, right? So, you Ham, you're destroying it, it doesn't matter what level Ben Simmons is at also you're destroying anyone's career it's just such a heartless place this sports world and I and the more I've now started since I'm studying it and we're trying to identify knowledge gaps in the industry and uh, seeing the dark side of the sports industry as well through experiences and stories that we've heard from industry professionals just makes you think man what what is going on here and it's just such a merciless merciless heartless place to be in so and krishna i want you to actually elaborate on that more 
And Muzz, you know what I think is interesting is everyone is criticizing Ben Simmons. And I do think there's a little bit of lack of maturity right now from Ben Simmons. I think he's a little bit, um, he has to understand that this is, you know, like we've discussed on every single episode, it is a business. They need their players to show up. But I do think people have kind of forgotten the last, the, the, the treatment that he received even by Doc Rivers in that press conference after the Atlanta series, right? Discussing like he has a lot to work on. We don't even know if we're going to keep him. Things that as a player are not the most encouraging to hear from. I think, Muzz, in general, I think there has to be a little bit of a switch in how we look at Ben Simmons. I think, like you said, coming in as a number one pick, they gave him that max contract. So here's the other issue, right? He's on this massive contract. So he's currently on a five-year, $177 million deal contract. So average, he's earning about $35 million per year. That goes all the way up to 2025. So... He still has a lot of time left on his contract. So whoever takes him has a bunch of money still left to pay, you know, still left to pay him. And I think, Muzz, the issue is so far we've treated him till, you know, till the playoffs last season. He's been treated like a guy who is going to be a perennial all-star, a guy who is going to, you know, potentially at some point, maybe even, you know, come into the conversation for being an MVP player or maybe a top five, top seven player in the league. I actually don't have any optimism of that happening anymore. I think that playoff performance last season was just absolutely abysmal. Let's not forget his regular season was actually pretty good. Especially when Joel Embiid has gone down, he's really stepped up for the 76ers and helped them, you know, stay pretty high and you know, um, high in the Eastern Conference. The issue is he is just completely stagnated on the offensive end. I think every single season, we see three YouTube videos of him shooting the three. Everyone gets excited. He shoots some threes in, you know, before preseason and we get excited. But really, when we look at his offensive game, it's completely and utterly stagnated. He has to play. He, he has no confidence shooting the ball. And because he has no confidence shooting the ball, in tough situations, he's now lost confidence even driving to the basket, laying the ball up, dunking. I think he needs to go to a transformation somewhat similar to what Andrew Wiggins has gone through. I think for the longest time, everyone thought of Andrew Wiggins as this top player. He's going to be the next young talent. He's moved now into this position at Golden State where he's just a role player. And that's, I think, what Ben Simmons needs to be. He can be a really solid role player. He's phenomenal on the defensive end, arguably one of the best, um, one of the best, you know, wing defenders that exists out there. Great in defending guards and he's 6'10", which gives him a huge height advantage. So defensively, he's an absolute lockdown. Offensively, I just don't ever think he's going to be the next level, but he'll, he'll, he can still get you, especially in the regular season, a good 15 points a game just because he's that physically, physically gifted. And we've seen what he can do as a passer. I think the issue that he's having right now, in my opinion, is the expectation that's placed on him, both because of where he where he was drafted and his contract right now. So I, I think he has a lot of opportunities. We just have to change his perception of, of who Ben Simmons is. He's not an MVP. He's not going to be a perennial all-star. He's going to be a very, very solid role player who might have a game where he gets you 30-32, but he's not going to be that consistent all-star um, that people you know once thought of him as. Maz, where do you think he goes, though? So, I, I think it's a dead end, but, you know, Daryl Murray doesn't seem to give a shit. He might just keep him for as long as it takes until he gets a good deal. Where does he go? Who would be willing to take a chance with him? Krishnan, he's only 25. Like, that's what I keep that talking about. That is true. <laughs> You're, everyone's talking about, you know, he is definitely going through mental stress and trauma. Don't forget, he's in an alien country. He's Australian. He's not even American. Who does he run to? His family is back home in Australia on the other side, at the other corner of the world. And, and that pressure comes in because they are like, oh, you're getting paid so much, you're supposed to deliver. But has anyone even once taken a step back and said, listen, what ha, has, has anyone bothered asking him, what are you going through? What is the problem? Tell us, have that talk and all of that. The reason he's probably even turned down those therapy sessions is because he feels that no one's even wanting to listen to him. And they are just saying, oh, you need help. Maybe he just needs to have a humanly conversation with someone else. And that's not happened. That's what I'm trying to say. So like before all of this, he's not going to go anywhere till his mental state is sorted. So I think this is a conversation for us, us to have much later. But in terms of like, deeming where he would 
probably be a good fit. I would have like he would have been a good fit in LA instead of Westbrook. Hundred percent would have helped the team in a lot of ways because the Lakers are struggling on the defensive end. They've lost shooting is about the same now at this point. Shooting <laughs> is about the same exactly, exactly. So that doesn't matter. But the thing is, imagine AD and Ben Simmons on the same team. That is a lethal pairing that you can have in the back court and the front court. There's so much versatility. They both have such long wingspans. They would be a scary combination to deal with. And what that does is, it also gives Ben Simmons a lot of uh, men- less pressure as well because you know you have LeBron, so he can take a step back, do his own thing, play whatever role he has to play, and still be a starter. I'm I'm not saying he needs to play. I agree with the Andrew Wiggins thing. I think a role player is the way to go for Ben Simmons. But I'm saying like if he is a fit for a team, then it's probably a team like the Lakers. Which basically has all the pieces in place in play, but they don't have someone who is good on the defensive end and can at the same time make passes as well. I just don't see it happening. They, you can see the Lakers being exposed. Losing Caruso was huge, and it's so evident that they have no movement on the defensive end in the backcourt. So, I think. Because no one knows how to switch up on a man. People teams play the screen against the Lakers and it's gone. No one can seem to catch up. Bazemore, yes, when he's there, there is some of that movement. Horton Tucker's there. So, but anyway, that's a topic for another day. But I think definitely Lakers would be a team where he could go. Maybe even Boston. Boston would be an interesting fit for him as well because Boston lacks height. So having someone who can. Spread the flow out. Someone like a six ten point guard, like uh, Ben Simmons, could definitely add to that. And again, imagine him playing alongside uh, Jason Tatum and then Jalen Brown as well. Oof! I'm thinking story. about it. I mean, Boston don't really have a point guard. I mean, Marcus Smart is their point guard, but they've historically treated him as a backup. This they just had to play him as the starting point guard. Um, and much, I think you know. In general, I think the formula is pretty simple for teams that would be good with Ben Simmons. It's basically teams that have poor guard defense. I think you know he can really, really do a good job. And I think there are a lot of teams that are currently struggling with that. Just a bit of news as we're sort of recording this. Luke Walton has just been sacked from the Sacramento Kings. Uh, I just got the notification literally as we were we were discussing and i think he that's actually a team that could potentially use him they're absolutely terrible on the defensive end um i think for defensive rating they are currently 26th in the league i think buddy heel is a really really good solid shooter for them but they need some kind of wing defense that team is completely stagnated they're a team that could use him the couple of others that that came to mind that could potentially use some wing defense Timberwolves are another interesting team where they could they could look to potentially move away from D'Angelo Russell and bring Ben Simmons in. Anthony Edwards seems like the future for that team. He could pair pretty nicely with Anthony Edwards and Carl uh, Anthony Towns. Both of, you know those two being primarily focused on the offense. He could be more of a kind of defensive presence on that team. So I think teams like that are you know where he's you know has the potential to kind of shine in in what he's really good at. Uh, I know there's some conversation right now as well with the Detroit Pistons. Detroit Pistons don't have really a lot going for them. And the only thing that the 76ers seem to want is Kate Cunningham, which is absolutely not going to happen. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I think, again, like exactly like you, you know, I think it's teams where they could use some height in those wing positions that that that, that could use him. Um, but other than that, I, I, I don't see uh, too many teams. Again, like I said, it's a big contract. So that's going to be the big challenge to kind of move him. Exactly uh, why Krishna and I said Boston and LA particularly because they they can actually they are the box office teams at the end of the day the most successful teams in the league. So and and he would actually be a good fit. So that's why I picked those two. But moving on to the next person, Kyrie Irving, Brooklyn Nets. Kyrie Irving is a tough one. Uh, he basically, the essential reason he's not gone on his COVID vaccine, he says he's not doing it because he's upset with the COVID mandates in New York for people, you know, companies requiring people to get 
uh, get the shot, which leads to, you know, people losing their jobs. This is his way of essentially speaking out against it. The issue is to even enter the stadium in Brooklyn Nets, you have to get your COVID vaccine, which means he can't train with the team. The nuance with this whole issue with Kyrie Irving is he can't play with the Brooklyn Nets, but he could potentially play with a different team that doesn't have the same mandates to enter the stadium and train. But he would have the same issue if he went to a different city and like if he had to go back to play in the Brooklyn Nets. Maz, what's going on there? And I mean, I don't even know what to make of this. Will we even see Kyrie Irving this season? Is there any chance of that? Krishna, honestly, I don't understand this guy. Like, I, I genuinely don't. I just feel like he likes, he enjoys being rebellious more than anything. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to talk about the anti-vaxxing thing and all. That's not a conversation that I can have because I'm not a medical professional. Yep. But the point is that I just feel like he's doing all of this because he wants to always be the one who's going against everyone else. He seems to enjoy this by saying the earth was flat is. <laughs> one of the examples but it's not the only instance everyone talks about that but there have been so many instances in the past also where he said ridiculous stuff and done things just to go against everyone else not coming and speaking to the media for example knowing that it's a part of it and just being like no I don't want to talk to them because I have issues and because they seem to target me and all that jazz I mean, attending his sister's birthday party last year after all his outs, uh, you know, it was the reason why he couldn't, he missed a few games because he was at uh, um, at his sister's birthday party that led to him basically being in violation of COVID protocols for a few games last season. So, there's a bit of hypocrisy potentially in some of his That's comments. That's what I'm saying. So, and it doesn't end there, right, Krishna? It doesn't end there. Like, like you said, right? If he even switches teams, he still can't play in Brooklyn because of the rules. But it's not only Brooklyn. Toronto has also mentioned that unvaccinated NBA players won't be able to travel to Toronto to play against the Raptors starting January is what has been said because the NBA has a 95% vaccination rate. So, like, I mean, if you want to play and that is the rule, if you're earning money, then, I mean... My problem is not like he doesn't want to get vaccinated, right? My problem is I feel that he's doing it just because he likes this. He likes to be a problem child. That's my problem with it. So I'm not sure. But honestly, Kyrie can go wherever he wants. He's Kyrie. Where will he be a good fit? I do not know because, again, comes back to his ego. It didn't work in Boston in which I thought was a perfect match for him. I'm not really sure he's that valuable anymore in terms of actually helping a team win a championship. But he's definitely still one of the best players in the league. So I just, I I mean, I think, I think uh, I'm not sure which team he'll, he should probably go to or who will be interested in him because like I said, he's a problem child and who wants to then deal with more controversies and then break the bank for him. Because no matter what you may say, his status does not change. His his level is still that of a superstar. So, I don't know. It is a hard one, Maz. Exactly like you said, because it, as soon as he steps on the court, you're reminded of why we all love Kyrie Irving, right? His handles are amazing. He's an unbelievably, unbelievable scorer when he's on the court. So, there's no one questioning his value on the court. The question is always just, A, will he consistently be on the court? And B, will he be committed to the team that he moves to, right? Those are the two big questions that any organization will have uh, when it comes to Kyrie Irving. And like you said, Mas, it's complicated. Our issue, even my issue, similar to what you're saying, I don't necessarily have an issue with his stance, but I also understand the team stance and I understand that they can't then have him back. But I think the further, the more this happens, I actually think he loses his voice, right? So the voice that he has in media and I, I do think he's generally a well-intended person but he loses that voice the less basketball he plays unfortunately because his voice eventually comes from being a superstar in the NBA um, so it, it is rough to see but I want to go in I, I, you know in terms of teams that I think he could work well for I think um, there are a bunch of teams that could use some offensive firepower um, it, it to kind of 
sub supplement what they currently have. I think the Mavericks are a good example of a team that needs someone outside of Luka Doncic to kind of carry the load on the offensive end. Um, that could be a fun, you know, that could be a really fun tie up. Another interesting one that I saw, I was kind of reading through a few articles and another interesting one I saw was Spurs. Spurs are in this weird position right now where really there's no one interesting. Personality wise, it seems like a terrible fit. That doesn't seem at all like a player the Spurs would historically look for, but they're in complete lack of any kind of superstardom. So that is an interesting um, avenue they could, um, they could look for. Maz, anything interesting that any any other interesting teams you would consider Kyrie potentially moving to? I actually find the Dallas one very interesting. I don't, I personally, I don't feel that that would work. Doncic and Kyrie on in the same, like I that think that's only an All Star game that I would like to enjoy watching them. I don't think it would work from a long term perspective. But I mean, I do like the Spurs. It, it sounds very interesting, and I think if someone can. Get him in line. Also, it's pop, right? So, um, it's it's one of those where I do like that, but I also feel like maybe you know a team like Washington could use him for sure. Where where Bradley Beal, I still feel is dealing with all of like still is controlling a lot of their game and is the is the sole reason why Washington wins. Uh, they lack. Any sort of superstardom outside of Beal and Beal's just elevated his game to another level where he's he's sending out a message saying, "Hey, I just need one more guy. Give me that guy, and we'll start winning things." I would also potentially be interested in seeing him tie up with Cat potentially. Like that would be an interesting uh, team as well to see him playing with Towns. I think they would complement each other. So. Yeah, I think those two teams potentially and maybe a team like Indiana could use him where they just seem to, they they ha- like they have good pieces. I think they just need one guy who can bolster their offense and I, I Kyrie's that guy. Kyrie's definitely that guy who can uh, make Indiana potentially a semi-final team on the East. Potentially. I'm not saying they'll win with Kyrie again. Like I said, I don't think Kyrie is going to win a ring on his own anyway. So, but just to make a team more competent and just make the conference more exciting would would be interesting to see him in Indiana colors, which will again never happen because Indiana again has to give up potential future draft picks and give up three players who might be integral to making the conference semifinals. So it's very, very tricky in general. See, I didn't even think about Indiana. So that's an, that's an interesting one to, uh, to add into the mix. And just as a reminder for our viewers, so Kyrie Irving's contracts is potentially a little bit easier because he is a unrestricted free agent in 2023, but in 2022, he has a player option. Now, I can't imagine him exercising his player option because I don't think his value has gone up. So I th- I highly, highly doubt he'll be exercising his player option. Um, but let's see, unless maybe he finds something interesting that he thinks he can take up. Maz, I saw this on another podcast, so I'm going to ask you the same question. Who do we see play first between these two? Who is going to who's going to be in, you know end up coming back b- before the other? I think eventually Kyrie is going to give in. Uh, so that's why I've got to go with Kyrie. And w- uh, having read some of the articles around Ben Simmons, it's looking extremely unlikely that he's going to play for Philly ever again. So till he doesn't get traded, I don't think that's going to change. So I've got to go with Kyrie because. He did this, he had this similar fiasco. He's had this such fiascos in the past as well. And eventually he just comes and plays. Because I guess eventually he realizes that, hey man, I need some money. So, <laughs> so, so I, that's why. So I think I think eventually Kyrie will uh, be the first one back. Just to be different, I'll pick Ben Simmons. I think he'll come back for Philly. He'll have a couple of like very average games. Um, and I think they'll like, try to make it work and I think eventually realize it won't work and will kind of be forced to trade him. I think that's, uh, that's my thought. 
So Maz, this has been, you know, this has generally been a slightly, you know, bit of a downer, you know, to start off the conversation. Both players who aren't playing, kind of disappointing because they're still exciting players, um, irrespective of what whatever is going on outside, you know, outside of the basketball court. Let's get into something more fun, more upbeat, more exciting, Maz. This season, you know, it's it's still early. It's still early days in the season. I'm sure you're hoping that as a Lakers fan, there is a lot that can happen that will, you know, be different than the start of the season, but. In these few games, Maz, what are your biggest surprises in the NBA so far? Teams, players, whatever it is. You know it. I've always been a massive fan of this guy, and wh- whichever TV goes to, I've got. A, he's he's genuinely one of my favorite players in the league. He's such a live wire. It's Alex Caruso, so it's got to be Chicago Bulls. What a team! What a team, man! They they've been so exciting to watch. When Lonzo and Caruso are playing, give up scoring. You cannot score against them when Alex Caruso and Lonzo Ball are your guards defensively. Caruso is averaging 2.4 steals per game. Lonzo is averaging 1.9. That is all, That is 4.3 steals per game between the two of them. That's potentially... Eight points or so in transition every time because they're guaranteed to get a fast break when they get a steal. And they'd run the court and they both just give alleys to each other. Now, this is very interesting. It's become so good. And then you have Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan, both averaging over 26 points, almost 27 points per game. Wow. Vucevic has been the perfect complementary player in the center for them. It's it's a very, very strong lineup. 11 and 5 to start off is commendable. I didn't I knew they'll be good. I knew they'll be fun, but I didn't expect them to be so good. Also, I hate to say it, but the Knicks have been good. I don't I've personally I've never been a big fan of the Knicks, but they've just been getting better and better. And again, you all I love that Derek Rose is doing well. So not going to complain about the Knicks either. But yeah, I think these two teams, man, for me. And Maz, it's, it's, I mean, you, you just completely took the words from my mouth because I think I would have said Chicago as well. I'm based in Chicago. And after having initially come here, it was like Tom Thibodeau's last few years at Chicago. We were still actually okay. It was like Derek Rose holding on, Jimmy Butler holding on. Uh, but it's been a couple of rough years. And I have to say the same, Maz. You know, I thought this would be a team that would be just about making it into the playoffs. I thought they were playoff worthy, but 7, 8, 9, in my opinion. Um, but they've really, really shown up so far. The only caveat I will say for the Bulls is they've had a okay set of fixtures. They've played the Pistons twice. They played the Pelicans. They played the Raptors. Um, they played the, the 76ers back-to-back, but lost both those games. So the fixtures have been decent for them. Um, but I still expect them to be really good. And like you said, Maz, they are so, so fun to watch. They have great chemistry. Um, so I, I completely agree with everything you said on the Bulls. The other team I want to talk about, which is actually the name I thought you were going to say, Maz, are the Washington Wizards and Kyle Kuzma. But, so, but Krishna, I spoke about Washington in that previous episode where I said that they are going to be the team to watch. So that's why they didn't surprise me. I was but, I called for this because I knew Kuzma. Like, I genuinely thought that Kuzma has had all the skill sets to be a successful player. It wasn't working out in the Lakers because of the minutes. When Kuzma has freedom to play, he's always done well with the Lakers. When he's been the only guy on that court without the superstars, he's always done well. So that's why I didn't mention the Wizards. No, and you, you know, you, you're exa- whatever you, you're, exactly what you said, Maz, is exactly the energy this entire team is given. You know, this team, for some reason, it reminds me a lot of that Clippers team from a couple of seasons ago that just about made the playoffs. Um, it was that team that really had no superstars. They had just discarded Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan had left. It was looking like a team that would not even, you know, be the, in the playoffs. But it was the common the common theme was Montrezl Harrell has been on both these teams. There was this feeling of you know what, we're going to make this work together. And they still have a superstar, like you said, in Bradley Beal. And what's beautiful about it is, unlike in seasons past, it's not just Bradley Beal. Bradley Beal's still doing his thing. He's still the highest scorer on the team. But he's only averaging 23.7 points. When we look at his past years, he's like been competing for the scoring championship, like getting like 28, 29. 
And the reason is other people are chipping in. You're getting 17 points per game from Montrez Harrell, 15 points per game from Spencer Ninvidi, 13.6 points per game from Kyle Kuzma. So everyone's kind of chipping in. You have Contavious Caldwell Pope as well. They've gotten so many pieces from that trade with the Lakers, unfortunately, um, that they've been able to kind of assemble something that's been very exciting so far. Again, I do think their current standing, which is they're pretty high up right now. They're second currently, 11 and 5, second currently in the Eastern Conference with the same record as, as the Bulls. I do think they'll drop down from where they are currently, but I still am pretty confident they're going to be a playoff team. They're another team that's really fun to watch. It's hard not to root for them. They seem to be enjoying their basketball, sort of like the Bulls. So really excited for them. And my other pick, Mars, this is an easy one for me, the Golden State Warriors. They have been, I expected they'd be good, but they have been unbelievable. I also think they've had a bit of luck with the fixtures. They've they played some tough teams. They did play the Lakers. They did play the Clippers. And they beat Port, which is kind of impressive for them. Um, but or at least they beat the Lakers. I don't know if they beat the... Uh, I don't know if they beat the Clippers as well. But they did beat the Clippers as well. So they had a phenomenal start to the season. Was the best part about this team is on both ends of the floor, they are doing a fantastic job. Both in terms of offensive rating. So defensive rating, they're first in the league. An offensive rating, their third in the league. I didn't expect this. You know, obviously they have Steph Curry. Steph Curry is just falling out on a whole different level. No question, in my opinion, the MVP right now. But they're still missing Clay Thompson. They're still missing um, uh, James Wiseman. So they're still missing pieces. But somehow it's just meshing together beautifully. It's just a team where chemistry has brought them this whole new level of performance that I'm completely shocked by. I definitely didn't expect them to be first in the Western Conference. And it looks like once they get Clay Thompson back, you would think they can only get better. Steve Kerr is a genius. I don't think he gets enough credit. I do not think he gets enough credit. He is so calm, so collective, and just knows how to set up a right team. And, you know... I'm telling you, people say, oh, he had Steph. People say, oh, he had KD. People say, oh, he had Clay, And obviously, Draymond at that time. And of course, they did. Look at the Lakers. Look at their team. What are they doing? Nothing, right? So, I don't think coaches get enough credit in the NBA, unlike in football, where it's the opposite, right? So, where... Pep is put on a pedestal. Klopp is put on a pedestal. Mourinho used to be put on a pedestal. It's it's changed a lot. And basketball does not give coaches enough respect. Uh, Steve Kerr has been brilliant. We saw it last season as well. Wiseman was out for so long. Yes, Steph carries that team. Yep. But no matter how much Steph does on the offensive end, you still need a defense to ball out and give it their all. And they're everyone's just all over the place and in your face at all times. They, like you said, Krishna, they've only lost two games, right? So far. They lost to the Grizzlies and they lost to the Hornets. <laughs> two games which you would have otherwise expected them to win, but to credit where it's due, both Grizzlies and Hornets really fought hard to win those games. Uh, I mean, especially the Grizzlies, oh, that was an amazing game. I think that was the game of the season so far. But Steph, man, Steph gonna Steph. He's just like how he's he's a cheat code. I keep saying this. He's he's an absolute cheat code, and I can't wait to watch Clay come back and watch these two splash brothers again, man. Beating the Lakers right now is not like anything. So let's not even go there. And I'll tell you one more thing that I read recently, and why this Lakers front office just is appalling to me. Has been for so long. It doesn't change. They want to trade DeAndre Jordan, Horton Tucker, and Kendrick Nunn for Harrison Barnes. And I just don't understand these trades, man. They make no sense. You can't give up one more young gun and then in hopes of winning now because clearly you let go of integral pieces in Lonzo Ball. You let go of KCP. Kuzma, fine. But KCP, Lonzo, Harrell, uh, Caruso, all 
key pieces to make this win now team which is quite clearly shitting the bed so mas you are absolutely absolutely right and i th- and i think what is what scares me about the lakers is they have such little depth and when they get injuries then the depth goes even further so it's it's an extremely scary situation for the lakers not looking so good so far russell west brick as it was uh, as as derek fisher called him is not looking so great um i think we called this uh, like two like, like about a year ago we called him one of our most overrated players in the nba he's kind of living up to that expectation right now i still am optimistic he'll come back the way he always does um, and gets better over the year but not looking good for the lakers man and every player they've traded looking fantastic on the teams they're on looking fantastic <laughs> that's what i'm saying it comes back to just bad management it's been like it does it take us it's not rocket science to know that these players will click with a particular team just keep those pieces pieces in place you won the championship and then you change around the team you don't go out of your way to keep that team together it was just bizarre really because they traded rondo they traded white and then they got them back after losing the next year what are you doing man what what plans did you have what there was no agenda nothing in place it's just really like i, I don't know what to say man i've <laughs> it, right, recent times it's just been hard to be a sports fan for me uh in general yeah, across being, sports for you yeah it's across, across sports for me it's been really difficult to deal with uh what it's like heartbreak after heartbreak or just like shockers after shockers more like that so yep. <laughs> i i think i'm going to start watching golf that's my next step now <laughs> So Mars final last segment that you this was your idea and I think it's a really really great segment start of the season early season Mars looking at the game so far what is your starting five if you had to pick a starting five right now in the NBA who do you got I think I think you know uh, I think we'll have the same names all We probably have a lot of overlap yeah 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 so it's got to be uh actually I do have I'm a bit confused but Let's go position wise. So yep. I'll go. So I'll go with point guard Steph. No, so no brain now. Same for me. I I mean, dude, the guy is also not just shooting. It looks like he's flinging the ball. Like he's shooting the ball so fast. I mean, but short answer. I could agree more. Steph is my answer too. Then shooting guard. Oh, that's a tricky one. I'm I'm actually like a bit confused for on this one, but I. I I'm going to go with Zach Levine. I I I'm going to go with Zach Levine. I know like again I feel like he's one of those that's severely underrated and he's really just getting better and better every game I see I watch him play I've just seen significant improvement from him. So I'm going with Zach Levine. See I think Zach Levine is actually the perfect pick because um he is shooting uh, he's shooting 49.8% from from two point range oh sorry just 49.8% overall Field goal, 40% think, from yes. three yeah and 40 40% from three as well but just to switch it up i'm going to pick demar derozan he's actually shooting worse than zach levine from three but just to pick someone different i'm going to go with demar derozan i think he's been clutch pretty clutch for the bulls as well he's shooting a lot more towards the end um of the game so i'll choose a different bulls guard for uh, the, the the shooting guard position who you got for small forward mas um I I I want to actually okay I'll go with KD in small forward because I I want to you know its names going in power forward then and I want to accommodate both of them so so I'm going with KD at small forward uh yeah I mean, you can't not put KD there there's man. no one I could put in this position the guy must you know this year I was I I was in New York got to go to a nets game nets lost at this game we watched but just watching kd is just unbelievable he doesn't his body doesn't make sense he's so lanky he looks so skinny mus he looks so skinny relative to everyone else but he absolutely dominates on the offensive end agree with you number 3 is kd i'm going to guess at who your power forward is is it yarn is it for How can I not have that Greek freak? There's a clear bias always because he's Greek. But no, man, what a... people aren't talking about him. That's how good he is. 
<laughs> that's how good he is they just know what to expect day in day out he does that commitment i think what stands out the most about yanis is his commitment to every game he's always full throttle doesn't matter if it's the first game of the season doesn't matter if it's the 82nd game of the season doesn't matter if it's the if it's game four of a dead rubber also in the post season like he's just so good man has to be him i i completely agree it's hard. it's really interesting because the bucks themselves not necessarily you know in the best situation right now um looking at the eastern conference i actually wonder where they are they're eighth in the eastern conference kind of surprising Nine and eight so far, but Giannis has still looked incredible. He's shooting actually pretty well. Um, I'm trying to see his 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 player stats for this year. I remember it being like he's averaging games. almost 28 points and he's shooting around 50 percent from the field, is as per my knowledge. And I think he's also uh, his rebound average is 12 or something like that. So yeah, he's absolutely balling. He blocks per game again, almost two. So. Just... God damn. Also, yeah, the stats are bang on, Maz. Yeah. Every single stat that you said was bang on. The only area he's struggling in is basically his three-point shooting, which has always been a struggle. He's It's getting better, but, you know. He's still not attempting matter. that. I mean, uh, he might not be attempting that much as well, to be fair. Uh, so, uh, that's... Uh, but he'll get better. He'll get better. So. That's true. I was looking at it. He averages 4.5... Steph Curry averages 13.5 threes per game. 13.5. I mean, it completely makes sense. I, I don't disagree with this decision. And he's shooting 40%. 40, Forty. He's shooting 42%. He's not even 40%. He's yeah, 42%. That's true. It's monstrous, man. Like, it's crazy. It's it's unbelievable. Um, and but, center, Krishna, drum roll. Let's go. Let's go. I got to go with Jokic, you know, MVP last year. He's still looking really solid. Um, I actually feel like there's been a bit of a dearth in center performances this year. I feel like I don't think of any, I can't really think of too many other names this year in the center position, but I don't know. Who do you have, Maz? I would have also picked Jokic for sure. I, I mean, boy, he's just an all-round uh, genius. Like you said, there's a dearth of good centers. But I, I would say Towns, like I said, I think Towns has been balling this season. I've always, I've waited for him to have this type of a season. Like he's always been amazing. No doubt. He's always all-star capable. But we're really seeing the elite level of Towns this season. Just hoping he keeps it going, stays fit and yeah, continues balling because he is the second best center right now in terms of i'm not sure about the stats but he's definitely like in terms of the what he's adding to his uh, minnesota team definitely makes a big difference in general so I, I, but i'm i'm still going with jokic but i'm saying i have to give a shout out to towns as well i think he's the only other name i was kind of looking through even the list of like top scorers in the nba the only other name even in you know who's interesting potentially is a bam adebayo but Really interesting. Not a lot of centers performing. Even uh, Joel Embiid looking a little bit shaky, despite the Philly, you know, 76ers doing well at the, you know, at the start of the season. They've dropped a few games recently, but um, yeah, not a lot of centers. Um, but anyway, Mazar, thanks so much. Another awesome NBA episode. Do actually let us know who your favorite players are in the league right now. If you want to give it by position, without position, just let us know. Let us know if there are any other topics you'd like for us to cover. We're going to sign off for this week, but we'll have a whole new episode next week. So do check that out as well. If you enjoyed this episode, of course, leave a like, share, subscribe, do all the things they say you should do. Thank you. Enjoy your rest of your week and uh, see you next week. If you like this episode, make sure to leave a like and share it with anyone else who might be interested. You can also subscribe on any social media platform that you prefer and all our links are in the bio. We also have a website with all our episodes as well as blogs and a whole lot of other sports content so make sure to check that out as well.